Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Schwenke, and I am ProPublica's news apps editor. Last month, ProPublica introduced the 527 Explorer, which is a database uh, about of information about obscure nonprofits known as 527s, through which millions of dollars flow annually, reaching more than $1 billion spending and receipts in 2022. Now, the organizations we're discussing are not regulated by the FTC, so they're not like super PACs. Um, and they do not have restrictions on who can contribute or how much they can give. Instead, they file this information uh, with the IRS in sort of a um, a way that we sort of called a junk drawer, it's just sort of a big file. Uh, we'll get into what exactly 527s are in just a minute and sort of the features of the database and what we've done. Um, but for now, let's say our searchable database makes it easy to explore who funds these organizations, how they spend their money. Uh, in today's webinar, we will show you how to make the most of this database, including advanced search features uh, and deciphering expenditures and contributions. We will focus largely on how journalists can use this tool to conduct their own reporting, but this information should be valuable to anyone interested in money's influence and in politics. Uh, we received tons of questions in advance of this, and we only have an hour to get through a lot of information, but we'll do our best to address your needs. You can submit a question anytime by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Joining us today uh, are Ruth Talbot, Brandon Roberts, Ellis Samani, and Ilya Moritz. Ruth and Brandon are news app developers at ProPublica, uh, and Ellis is a data reporter here. Ilya is currently a reporter at the Boston Globe, but he previously wrote a story for us that partially inspired this news app. Before we get into more detail on the database, how to use it, and what exactly a 527 is, let's talk about a 527 you may have heard of, called the Republican Attorneys General Association. Ilya, will you walk us through your story uh, on how you ended up using this data to report it out? Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining, and thanks for the intro, Ken. Um, so uh, back in 2022 and 2023, when I was working at ProPublica, we got interested in the Republican Attorneys General Association. It is an example of one of these 527 groups. It looks a bit like other kind of political groups, uh, that might be a little more familiar, kind of PAC or super PAC, um, but they're also a little different. They are 527, they're IRS regulated, and as I found out, their filings end up in this uh, sort of junk drawer. Uh, RAGA, as it's known, was specifically interesting to me because of its activities around the 2020 election and the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Um, a few weeks before the attack on the Capitol, uh, I believe it was 17 of the Republican attorneys general filed an emergency motion with the Supreme Court to try to block essentially four states electoral votes from being counted four states that happened for, you know, tight purple states that happened to have gone for Joe Biden in the 2020 election. And that was kind of an extraordinary thing to see uh, so many chief state legal officers um file a motion like this with the Supreme Court. It was unsuccessful. It didn't get a hearing, but nevertheless, it seemed like kind of a bold statement. And then a few weeks later, uh, just before January 6th, Raga sponsored a robocall to get people out to the rally on the National Mall on January 6th. Uh, the robocall didn't say, you know, riot and invade the Capitol, but it had a very strident angry tone that again was kind of out of keeping with what one would normally expect um, for chief state legal officers. In response to all of this, uh, a lot of the corporations that fund RAGA uh, announced that they were halting their contributions or reviewing or suspending their contributions. And so you know, a year later, it was actually more than a year later, we wanted to go back in and have a look and see, uh, one, were these corporations still pausing their contributions? And two, had Raga kind of meaningfully changed its posture on the election, its posture on the riot at the Capitol and that kind of stuff? Uh, the answer to the second piece of it is, you no, know, not really. I went to a Raga um, event in New Orleans where um, it was very much a, a stop the steal kind of vibe, although I guess I would say the speakers I saw had, had more or less moved on to other subjects. Um, there was still a, a very angry kind of strident tone there. But was what was really interesting is that in the meantime, without 
um, making any kind of definitive break uh, with the Supreme Court filing without really coming clean and clear about what had happened with that robocall, the Republican attorneys general did have money coming in again from big corporations, companies like Comcast uh, and a number of others that are mentioned in the article. And the big task for me in this piece was to really run through who were the top donors, who were the ones who stayed away, and who were the ones who came back, and then go to the ones who came back in particular and ask them for comment and try to find out why they had come back. Um, about that time is when I turned to Ken and his team. And I was like, you guys develop amazing apps. Uh, how can you help me? Uh, they did help me. Uh, Ken was able to kind of bulk download several years of data. But when he handed it to me, he, he gave an important caveat. And feel free to jump in because you'll remember better than I will, Ken, on what the exact caveat was. But basically, you said, like, handle with care. You know, if you add column A or, you know, total up column B, that's probably not the exact number because uh, what we ended up pulling in included a lot of amended filings. So you really want to review the numbers very carefully and take them more as an indicator than as anything kind of solid. Is that what you said? Yeah, the data is sort of rife with duplicates and some errors, as Ruth um, and the team know very, very well at this point. And so I sort of extracted the information for Ilya handed it to him and said, you know, it's up to you to make sure that this is correct, but this should give you, you know, the information you need. Yeah, and it, and it really did. So what I ended up doing was um, kind of setting up smaller questions that I could answer where I could go in and, and kind of clean the data and carefully just make sure that I hadn't doubled up or tripled up any any contributions or expenditures, again, because these are periodically filed and they often include... Um, amendments. Uh, yeah, sometimes contributions get returned. Sometimes things were entered in error. You get the idea. So that's a very easy way to kind of accidentally get things wrong. And I, I had to sort of triple check my work to make sure that I didn't. But I do remember talking with Ken and I could sort of see that he was having like a little bit of a light bulb moment. He was like, oh, that's a thing that like we could like make where we could like maybe be useful, probably not to you right now on your timeline, Ilya, but um, maybe in a broader way. And that's why I'm so, so excited that this is now live because um, it makes it possible to like really suss out a lot of interesting story ideas and get numbers that are a lot more trustworthy than what I was able to see. And I think 527s, are really, really interesting because they do fly somewhat behind below the radar, but they are um they're really big players. The Republican and Democratic Governors Association, uh Republican and Democratic uh 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 forget what it's called, elected leadership committees that route a lot of money to local candidates. So um this you know, and I, I remember, you know, I was looking specifically when I was looking at Republican AGs, I was looking specifically at, you know, like Walmart and Comcast type companies coming back. But as I spent hours and hours with these filings, I started to see all kinds of other interesting things that I hope some of the people on this call might start taking a look for this, this kind of thing. Mike's Hard Lemonade was one of the most consistent founders, uh, uh, now founders, contributors to the Republican AGs. I think they also gave a lot to the Democrats. It's also always good to look at who gives to both. Similarly, a lot of these um, rail shipment companies like rail transit freight companies give a lot to the AGs. That's probably also worth examining as well. So that's kind of what I think the continuing utility of the tool um, can be. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. I think, you know, what you said is right and why I wanted to start with your story is not only did it um, sort of spark this idea in our heads that we could do this, but it was because you had identified, you know, a very influential organization politically with a lot of money going to it by like a lot of well-known names. And this data was locked up in, again, what we kind of call this junk drawer. Um, they're not these super PACs that you can search with the FEC. The FEC has a really good website that you can search. They're not um, 501 nonprofits, right? Like ProPublica is a 501 nonprofit. And you can look up its 990s relatively easily on ProPublica's Nonprofit Explorer, a little plug there. Um, but there really is no easy way 
um, to look up this information for these similarly powerful um, five to seven organizations. Uh, and that is sort of what sparked the idea of making this uh, database. On that note, I think it may be worth um, taking it over to Ruth Talbot, who is the uh, lead developer for um, the project to explain a little bit about what a 527 is exactly. Um, that it's more than just Raga and uh, go use the database and go use the feature there. Hey everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, we're excited to kind of walk you through our database and show you what you can do with it. Um, but sort of backing up, uh, we wanna sort of talk about what a 527 is. So at a very high level, um, and this is sort of a simplistic definition, but at a high level, when we say 527, we mean a political organization whose kind of explicit support for candidates is limited. So they aren't primarily focused on electing a specific federal or state candidate. Uh, and because of that, these organizations aren't subject to uh, federal or state election law usually, and they're not filing on a federal or state level. And I, I think Ken and Ilya both touched on that, but because of that, they end up filing with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, and so to make this maybe a little more concrete, I have three examples here. So the first one is uh, Make America Great Again, whose primary purpose is to reelect Donald Trump. Uh, a federal candidate, obviously, so they are filing on a federal level. Uh, Whitmer for governor's primary purpose is to reelect Whitmer in Michigan, so it is filing on a state level. Um, however, there's a group called the Democratic Governors Association, uh, which influences governors' races nationwide, um, kind of similar to uh, Raga, which Ilya talked about. It's influencing nationwide races, uh, but state state level. Um, and it's not focused on like a single one of those races. Um, this is pretty typical of the larger organizations in our database. Um, they're, they're often these national organizations that influence state and local races. Uh, but there are also a range of smaller organizations in the database and just a lot of uh, fun, little funky things to explore, I think, as, as kind of Ilya and Ken hinted at. Um, and like Ken said, because these organizations do not file with the FEC, Experts often told us that they're just not subject to the kind of same oversight, like the IRS isn't do necessarily doing the same kind of checking on these filings. And so you do kind of get sometimes this very messy data. Um, so let's dive into the database, um, which requires me screen sharing uh, one second. All right. Um, so this is the database. Um, so every year, um, sorry, I just started reading the, the top of it. Uh, it's called 527 Explorer, um, and this is kind of the landing page. Um, it's a good place to go if you um, just kind of don't know what you're looking for, but you want to start exploring. Um, you can hop into our search, which Brandon will talk about more in a little bit. You can see kind of the flow of money over time. Um, or drill into the kind of the largest organizations or activity by state. Um, if you do uh, want to hop into a specific organization that you have in mind, uh, one of the primary features in the database is its organization page. Um, so did I share? Uh, can someone, did I share my whole screen or just share a page? Are you seeing Raga or are you seeing everything? I am seeing Raga. Perfect. Okay. Clearly, I am not super great at this, but we're working with it. Um, so for an example, I want to start with uh, Ilya, the Ilya's um, organization, RAGA, the Attorney, Republican Attorneys General's Association. Um, for each organization, we have kind of this summary information, financial overview, top contributors, largest recipients, things like that. Um, but the main data and kind of the, the thing that the app does really well is it surfaces these line item contributions and expenditures. Uh, so this is what Ilya was looking at when he was looking at who was giving to Raga. Um, and we surface for each organization, all those contributions, all those expenditures, you can kind of click around and explore. Um, we provide a lot of filtering. So if you are interested in like 2020 or 21, you can click that, apply that filter, see everyone who gave in 2021, uh, if you are interested in a specific organization, say Comcast, uh, which I believe Ilya looked at, you can apply that filter um, and you can see really clearly um, one of the things that Ilya spoke about in his article, which is that 
Comcast really came back and has been giving to Raga uh, ever since January 6th. Uh, you can also see pretty clearly what Ilya talked about in terms of the dip in donations. So we have for each organization, a chart that shows data over time. And you can go to quarter one in 2021 uh, and see that donations did really dip, but you can also just go to quarter two and see that they came back pretty strong. Um, you can also scroll down for each individual organization to a disclosures page. So this is kind of um, the actual reports that are being filed with the IRS. And for each one of those, we have um, a summary section, which just shows you know, money in, money out for each, each report. Um, but you can also click in to um, an individual report and see a little bit more information on that. Very similar features, but drilled down to a specific report filed. Uh, if you don't know necessarily like an organization that you're interested in looking at, there's a few ways that you can get started. And I'll speak about one of them and then pass it over to Brandon to speak about a few more. Um, a good one is uh, with our state pages. So if you are a reporter based in a specific state or someone who's located in a state and you're really interested in that, for each state and territory, we have a page. These pages provide some summary information. Um, we have a largest organizations and a new organization section, which really kind of are there to help guide you to maybe a new organization that just appeared that might be of interest or a large organization that is a big player in your respective state. Uh, you might notice the Patriot Legal Defense Fund is in both these lists. Um, that is a, let's see if I can pull up the CNN article. Um, that is, or CFBS, um, that is a legal defense fund that was reportedly set up to help uh, pay the legal uh, bills of Trump's allies. Um, so, you know, it just kind of helps you see like, oh, is there maybe an interesting organization in my state that I would want to dig into? And then you can open that org page and play around, look at the line item contributions and expenditures, um, et cetera. We also have um, out-of-state and in-state contributors. These are just big players that are either giving to your state um, or big players based in your state. Um, so these are corporations and people who are giving a lot of money um, to 527s. Uh, we have all contributions and expenditures in a state similar to with an organization. Um, and then one thing specific to a state we have is this recent activity section. This just surfaces the largest contributions and expenditures that were made in any given state or territory in the last year. Uh, it's kind of a good way to see where some of the kind of larger transactions might be flowing to and from. And you can kind of scroll through that. And then the last thing I think that's important here is just uh, an all organization section. If you want to filter and sort the organizations in your state, um, see who's kind of getting the most contributions, who's making the most um, making the highest expenditures and things like that. Um, if you're not interested in a specific state, maybe you're interested in a person or a term, uh, a good place to start is our search, which I'm going to pass off to Brandon to talk about. Uh, welcome everyone, glad you're here. Um, all right, so we're gonna start talking about search, um, how to explore stuff. Um, I like to start with viewing everything. So we have a search bar here. We have some advanced search help, but down here we have explore all, and we're gonna start with um, some contributions. Um, this one, this allows you to see the first 10,000 results of any search. So this is the first 10,000 contributions in the data sorted by date here. And if we wanna see, What's the largest contribution in the entire data set? Uh, sort by that. And let's see this one. But, oh no, this is the d danger of the live demo. All right, that was it. Uh, we had the we had the governor of Illinois giving a sixteen million dollar contribution to the it was the DGA. Um, so yeah. Here we have, so if you search the contributions, you can obviously search name, you can search the, the city um, of the contributor, the organization, but you also get this occupation field um, and the employer. So if we wanna find other civil servants who have donated to 527s, um, we can do that here. Oops, 
we can search state of Illinois and we're going to use advanced uh, search syntax here. We're going to put that in parentheses. And what that'll do is bring back all these various people who work for states that they live in, um, who they donated to. Over on the right is where we get into the filters. This is important if you want to find specific stuff. So for me, I'm going to search my state, Washington, and we'll see who works for the state of Washington, who they are contributing to. And you can just see we've got a bunch of results back. Okay, and then, so the next thing is if we want to, let's look at one of the organizations that Ellis reported on National Cancer Alliance. Um, he'll talk about this more. Let's look at the contributions to this organization down here. This is the, the same essential search, um, but just from this organization. So we can see this best efforts used. That's an unusual phrase. You don't see that a lot. So if you see something like this in the data, um, it's a it's a good idea to search for that. And here we got all these contributions with best efforts used. And these are other packs that were also mentioned in Ellis's reporting. So if you see something interesting, something that pops out to you, um, you know, put it in the search, surround it in quotes, and see what you get back. Okay, we'll move over to expenditures. Similar to contributions, you can search for the recipient name, the city, the organization, but you also get this purpose field. Um, so this is like all these fields are kind of optional, but when people put it in here, they'll mention kind of briefly like what the what the uh, what the expenditure was for. And if we want to look for like are people um, using five twenty seven money to pay fines, and we can search that with the boolean and, and then we put fine and payment here in quotes, and we get these results. We got seven expenditures for various fines, um, kind of all over. Um, all right, and then we'll go to expenditures, look at all of them here, and then I've got them sorted by the largest. What's the largest expenditure? Um, the largest by far is this $82.5 million contribution um, from Empower Parents Pack to Never Back Down Incorporated in Austin 527 or uh, group, and then we will go into here. So if we want to know who, like we have these leaders right here, we want to know, like, are they associated with any other 527s? We can use some more advanced search syntax here. We can put all of their names in parentheses and then put these or symbols, and then that'll pull back any 527 that names them as leaders. And there are quite a few, as you can see, almost 600. Um, if we sort them by name, and then we can see um, Robert Watkins and Nancy Watkins. Um, they are deputy treasurer and treasurer of a lot of 527s in the data. Um, so yeah, anytime you wanna look for more people, you can do this here. Um, I Googled these people, Robert Watkins and Nancy Watkins, they're CPAs, um, and they were also, um, named as they're appointed um, various things in Florida by Ron DeSantis last year. So if we wanted to look and see, are they associated with any other DeSantis um, orgs, you can do that here, we put their names in parentheses. So either Robert or Nancy Watkins and, and DeSantis, and we pull back um, that they're the treasurers um, of the friends of Ron DeSantis. Um, the final thing that I want to show you is a contribution page. So if you click on a contribution across the site, you'll be brought to a page like this. Um, this is a contribution from Google to this 527, um, $25,000. And what this page does is since addresses come across in a lot of different formats, it can be very difficult to try to link them up. So this page tries to give you a bunch of possible other Google um, contributions. Um, we can see here in contributor addresses. Um, Google's address is 1600 Amphitheater Parkway, but we had 160 and that one still came up. So this will help you look at the different variations in naming um, and addresses so that if you're trying to get kind of totals or something, you can do that. Um, if we want to pull up who, who you know, who's Google giving to, um, you can see that Google gave to Tim Scott for Congress and there's 
This is a contribution um, from something called Google Incorporated NetPack. If we click this, they'll bring us to another contribution page just having to do with NetPack. And we have all these, um, these, these Google NetPacks. And if we want to get like, you know, an approximate total of how much Google NetPack has given in the data set, um, you know, we can sort these Google NetPacks at the top. We can include them in our, in our sum and we get, you know, a good starting point for a total for how much they may have given $35,000. So this is kind of what you can do with the search. Um, we don't try to give you all the answers. We try to you know, give you a good starting point so that you can um, kind of cut through some of the difficulties of the data. And I'll and pass it back. I think it's worth pausing on that and sort of just like sort of restating um, to people what you were doing. So like, if you go back to Tim Scott for Congress um, or wherever, uh, essentially, you know, Knowing that this is a really complex data set and knowing that um, there are many variations in spelling of things like addresses, of things like name, and there is no unique identifier for um, contributors or um, people who have received expenditures, uh, instead of spending um, time or attempting really complex technical solutions to normalize all of that information, uh, what we've done is we've created this tool um, that applies a little bit of machine learning um, but when you click a contribution or an expenditure, we'll bring up a page where it says like, hey, here are some best efforts from us to match up uh, you know, this contribution, this person, this company um, to other names in the database that seem similar. Uh, and we provide you like several tools like address matching, name matching, and things like that to allow you to select only the ones that you think are actually the person or company that you're looking for. Um, and that way you can build up, as, as Brandon showed you, you can total up the number of contributions from a specific company um, or to a specific uh, person by uh, utilizing these tools and doing a little bit of the sifting yourself. What we realized was that, you know, while some of our variations of machine learning got us like much closer um, to the answer, we didn't want to pretend like we um, were able to crack the code of matching up all of these names across, across the database. Uh, and potentially be wrong. Uh, and so we instead created this sort of system that allows you to apply some of your human intelligence uh, to this to figure out exactly um, what set of contributions that you are looking for. Also, the search sort of, as Brandon showed, can be you know a little more vague, right? So like if you search for a name, it searches for variations of that name or you know very similar sounding names so that you don't have to um, hit on the exact name. So you can search for exact names if you, if you wish. Yeah, and Ruth, I had, well, there was a question about 990s, and I forget whether you showed um, the sort of 990 section of this. The, to answer the question, um, 527s do not uh, necessarily have to file 990s, but some do. Uh, those 990s do not show up uh, in, say, a database like Nonprofit Explorer, um, but we have linked them in the app where they do show up, and they can provide you more information um, uh, to, to research one of these organizations. I don't know if you have one off the top of your head, Ruth, where you could show where that is. Uh, yeah, I can show where one is. I pulled up perhaps not the world's best example because it only has one. Uh, but this is an organization that has 990s as well. And so you can go here and all we really do is link it, but it makes it really easy to see, um, to just get straight to a 990 when an organization does have one instead of kind of going through the complicated IRS search for it. And that will give you a little more information. Uh, Ruth, it may be worth it too, before we switch to the next section, uh, not to put you on the spot too much, but do you want to sort of show like the IRS webpage so that people can sort of see the difference between this and and what we've built? Uh, yes, <laughs> one second. <laughs> it's, it's worth seeing. Uh, so this is the IRS search, which Ken was talking about. Um, it does have some advanced search features. Uh, they're just, and, and in some ways, you know, it can be very 
pointed and powerful, uh, but it's also very limiting. Like it's, it is really hard to search for specific terms easily. Um, you can't really do the same kind of anding or oring. Um, it's it's just not quite as broad. Um, so, but I can. So this is uh, form uh, eight eight seven two, uh, which is kind of the primary report piece um, that where we get these line item contributions expenditures for. You can search for here, and if I say go uh, hit search. Uh, it'll pull up a bunch of possible results of organizations, uh, and you can click into one of those, and this is the Democratic Governors Association, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and you can see kind of every report it's filed, uh, and you can also click into them. Um, but it's in PDF format, and it's just, it's just a little hard to work with, uh, hard to aggregate. Um, one thing we do, I think, that I don't believe I touched on uh, for each contribution and expenditure section, we do, once you've filtered to a certain, let's see if there are Comcast results for the DGA, um, once you've filtered to under a certain number of contributions, we do allow you to export that. So it makes it really easy if you want to do kind of your own calculations to get the slice of data you want um, and start working with it. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're working with PDFs, uh, it's just a little harder to jump into that kind of data analysis. I'm tempted to go to some questions right now because there's some really good ones, but I will hold them till the end. Uh, but you are all asking really great questions. Um, and before we get to the questions, I want to talk a little bit more about a story um, that we just published uh, that Ellis uh, can. published. Yeah. Can I talk about my data caveats first? Oh, yes. Go to the caveats. We must talk about the caveats. Um, and Connor, if you could pull up the slides for that, that would be great. I can also do that. Um, awesome. So I feel like everyone who spoke has touched on this in one way or another, uh, but this data is self-reported uh, by organizations. And a lot of experts told us that, you know, the FEC does a lot of monitoring of the data that comes through to them. They'll look at things, they'll say, you know, why doesn't this number line up? Or like, you didn't file a report for this period. Um, and often that similar oversight just does not happen on the IRSF side. And there's a lot of ways that kind of manifests in the data. If you go to the next slide. Uh, Brandon really touched on this. Uh, I don't need to report, repeat it too much, but um, there's a lot of variations on how names are reported here. There's no like one identification for a contributor or a recipient in this data. Um, so, you know, Jay Pritzker, uh, governor of Illinois, appears in this data in like maybe seven different ways. Um, and on top of that, there's also sometimes just outright misspellings and, and errors in the data. So, you know, organizations will mistype a word or a name. So it's really good to use the powerful search, really search for different variations on names and terms and make sure you, you have kind of a sense of every way a person or a corporation might appear in the database. Next slide. Uh, another big thing that Ilya touched on is amended reports. Uh, so uh, an organization can file an amendment for a report. Um, and for the most part, these amendments are pretty straightforward. Uh, we try to make it really obvious which one you should use, and we only include uh, the most recent amended report in the totals that we use for an organization. Um, and usually, when you look at it, it's pretty obvious which one is the final amendment. Um, and these are two examples of pretty straightforward amendments. I think this is for the Democratic Governors Association, but I could be wrong. Um, like for this mid-year report we have down at the bottom, um, there's an earlier mid-year report, uh, not in bold, and you'll see it's for the same time frame. Uh, it's roughly the same amount of total contributions and expenditures. It's pretty obvious that like maybe they just tweaked something really small, and so they filed an amendment. Um, next slide. Uh, for the one above it, it's a uh, one back. It's a it's a little less clear uh, for this end of year report. There's two previous end of year reports. One covers from July to September, 
one's October to December, and the final one is that entire time period. So this is pretty common. You'll see like an organizational file, one report for a subset of a time period, and then realize they want to file one that covers like all of that time period. Um, but again, this is a pretty straightforward version of an amendment. Uh, next slide. The, the where it gets complicated is organizations that really filed a little chaotically. So you'll see organizations in the database that filed reports that overlap in time periods, despite claiming to be for different different subsets of time. Uh, so you'll see like October 19th or August 19th, October 19th, August 19th to so November 28th. Uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap there. Uh, we have really tried our best to remove duplicate data. Um, if we see something across multiple reports that is quite clearly a duplicate, we really try to we try to get rid of that. Um, and we also try to flag, uh, next slide, we try to flag kind of as much as possible where there might be duplicated data, where you really might want to verify totals. Um, so we're just trying to give you the tools you need to kind of look at this and say, okay, there might be, there might be some messiness here. I, I should dig in a little bit more. Uh, and like I said, this data is messy, so there, there are other data notes, but uh, those are kind of two of the main ones we want to draw your attention to. And Ken? Thank you. Uh, we love caveats. Um, now uh, I want to talk a little bit about a story that we published along with this. Um, Ellis uh, uh, Samani uh, wrote this and published it last month. Um, it came to us as we were going through the database and as Ruth said, we saw some odd things that um, raised questions. At the same time, last year, the New York Times uh, published a piece about um, a network of 527 groups that uh, appeared to be largely paying um, connected fundraisers. Um, and we sort of saw a very similar pattern uh, in our database and found um, very similar sets of organizations. And so I wanted to kick it over to Ellis to talk a little bit about his story. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, Connor, if you wouldn't mind queuing up the slideshow again. Um, so as Ken mentioned, you know, we kind of uh, started out jumping into, you know, trying to find connections between some of these organizations that seem to have uh, just a lot in common. You know, there were similar, groups that they were, um, you know, spending money, spending the donations on, you know, similar uh, contributors that were also giving them money. Um, and we wanted to kind of, you know, dig into with our reporting power to, you know, just see if we could kind of establish any connections across some of these 527 groups. Uh, so Connor, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so here are a handful of some of the organizations that we were looking into. You know, broadly, we found that a lot of them were, you know, at least on the surface, supporting causes that seem to be, you know, very, very broad, you know, breast cancer, firefighter, veterans. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, on the surface, you know, these all seem like kind of distinct organizations. But, you know, as you like kind of look at these organization pages, you'll notice that one of the really great things about the apps is that it kind of, you know, prompts you with some, you know, similar organizations already. And so this was like our starting place for, you know, kind of having a roadmap for various organizations to spend more time with. Um, and from that, you know, we could actually kind of go in and, you know, see that there were some uh, individuals that were giving, you know, substantial amount of money to several of the different organizations, even though on the surface, they seem to be kind of unique and, and separate. Um, we could go to the next slide. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I did kind of starting uh, as a starting place was kind of going in and looking at the expenditures in a little bit more detail. And one of the things that led us to was uh, this company called Office Edge. Um, and one of the helpful things that I did during my reporting process that I would encourage other folks that are looking to kind of delve deeper into the um, business operations of individual and groups of 527 organizations is just try and like kind of combine the records you're seeing within our database with other outside sources. And so for me, what that looked like was going in and, you know, looking at the corporate documents um, for Office Edge. And, you know, we found that the uh, individual who registered the firm um, was actually connected to um, this company called uh, um, Outreach Calling, which is a, you know, notorious telemarketing company that had gotten um, uh, shut down by the FTC years prior to, to this 527 activity. Um, but that was really key for us in sort of establishing a connection between 
um, not only um, you know this fundraiser, but other uh, uh, individuals connected to various um, entities that we were looking at. And so, you know, I think that you know you should really kind of view the uh, the five twenty seven explorer you know as a starting place and a good place to kind of you know start kind of establishing those connections. Um, you know, one of the additional sort of puzzle pieces that was really helpful um, is looking also at the treasurers of these groups. You know, that's another data point that we were able to use as a connecting point for, um, you know, looking at various ways that, uh, you know, these organizations might have have ties to one another. And on the right here in the screenshot, you can see um, all of the different um, groups in the network that we identified, all of whom were making payments to this firm, Office Edge, to the tune of over $800,000 um, in this example. And we can go to the next slide. So on the right is, is, is a man named Lawrence Eggers. And Lawrence Eggers is you know, one of several individuals within the network who, who gave thousands of dollars across to, to groups across um, uh, the, the network that we identified. And, you know, it was important for us to really get a chance to talk to the people who, you know, were giving to these groups and getting a chance to, to know what was compelling them, you know, to give money to these causes. And, you know, with, for Mr. Eggers, he's somebody who, you know, for most of his life has been really, um, you know, dedicated to volunteering his time and money. And he was telling us that, you know, he gets calls up to two to three times a day from these groups, you know, soliciting, um, funds from him. And, you know, I, I went over to his home and visited him and the, you know, the phone was ringing several times during our interview even, and it really just kind of hit home, you know, just how persistent these telemarketers are um, in soliciting funds at times. And, you know, for us, it was helpful um, to use, uh, to use the database as a, you know, as a resource for connecting, for connecting people and with people. And so I think, you know, for reporters that are interested in kind of, you know, you know, using this tool um, to do more reporting, it is really helpful uh, how you can kind of use the, um, you know, the connection patterns that, that Ruth and Brandon have developed in order to really assist you with, uh, you know, finding um, folks that, you know, may be open to, to speaking to you and also shedding some more light on, um, you know, the, the, the ways in which these groups, uh, you know, connect with, with, with various people for, um, for fundraising. And then I think we have one more slide. Um, and so, you know, this finally was just like another way in which we sort of established a, a connection between the different groups in our network. You know, we went out and tried to find all of their websites. The websites aren't something that are listed explicitly in the, the documents that these groups file with the IRS. Um, but a lot of these groups do have like a public presence. And so by going out and looking at their, their web pages, I was able to kind of find the donation service that they used, which ended up being like a really obscure payment processing site that seemed to only really be associated with these kind of, um, you know, kind of obscure 527 groups that only really, um, you know, seem to use this service. And so that was just another way of establishing a pattern. Um, and, you know, for a lot of these, I would say that, you know, there, there isn't always going to be like a clear smoking gun. You know, for us, we, ate, we you know, we really took as many steps as possible to kind of, you know, document every way in which these, these groups were connected. You know, we reached out to all of the groups and, you know, before, before publication. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things that happened during the, during the reporting process was that they all, um, for the most part, those that had websites ended up posting um, a nearly identical message kind of, you know, saying that, you know, you know, the purpose of, of our business operations is actually just to raise money. And, you know, it isn't actually to, to use these funds to support causes like, you know, supporting veterans or firefighters explicitly. And so that was like kind of a, a, a interesting kind of um, thing that, that, that kind of also ended up sort of also establishing the connection across the, across, the, but, but yeah, I would just, For, you know, any kind of other pre presence that they might have. Um, and, you know, that was something that ended up being really fruitful for us. I think so. There were, um, I may have missed this because my internet connection sort of pick up briefly, but did you mention a little bit more, I see some questions about um, what outside resources you used to corroborate this? So whether like there are there other databases or anything that you found like super helpful to corroborate and report out some of the information that you started with the 527 data? 
Yeah, absolutely. I can talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, I think one one of the things that's, you know, unique about the 527 groups that we we're reporting on is that, you know, um, they aren't required to file with the FEC, um, but the FEC does have a really helpful search tool where you can look at, you know, a number of different packs and kind of see similar information to what you're seeing within our database. And for, for, for me, that was actually really helpful because a lot of the individuals that were involved in the packs that we were reporting on, um, the 527s, they actually were also in, involved in other kind of political activity with FEC reporting groups. And so why that was helpful is because it kind of established a connection between certain individuals, some of whom were you know, running um, FEC reporting packs that were doing exactly the same kind of work as the groups that were 527s. Um, and so that was like a really helpful tool that we use. Um, on top of that, you know, groups like Open Secrets, you know, have also been um, kind of, uh, you know, collecting this, this similar kind of information for a while. And so that was another helpful way of kind of, you know, getting a sense of, you know, I think one thing to note here is like a lot of these groups, especially groups that you know, seems to kind of be doing some 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 dubious kind of business activity have been written about already. And so, you know, for us, it was kind of helpful too to just kind of see, you know, the patterns of, um, you know, groups being shut down and then, you know, kind of re reinventing themselves under a new name and kind of just establishing that connection um, was something else that was really helpful. Um, and then and then again, you know, like, like we talked about before, going to the IRS, you um, uh, site as well and pulling up the 990s was something that was really helpful for establishing connections too. One of the other sort of ways in which we saw that the groups were connected was that they were all using, um, not all of them, but a, a good chunk of them were using um, the same uh, accounting firm in order to file their uh, their tax records. And, and that's something that we don't explicitly call out in our database. But if you do go into the 990s for groups that do file 990s with the IRS, some of them do list, you know, an accounting firm that they may use. And that was like another thing that proved to be kind of helpful and, you know, giving us another, uh, another way to connect the groups too. And one last question for you all. Are there anything that you would consider like as you're going through the database, is there anything that you, or, or Ruth, honestly, that you would consider sort of like red flags or sort of like smells that would make you want to go in and dig deeper into an organization? Like when you look at a page, what piques your interest? when you first look at it? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I, I really, I really found myself just spending a lot of time with the, with the treasurers in particular, you know, and like you can even search the name of a treasurer for a group. And especially if you see, you know, individuals, you know, treasuring 527s across different states, you know, like that might pique your curiosity. Um, that was one thing. Um, yeah, I don't know, Ruth, do you have any, you know, things that kind of come to mind as, you know, things to kind of jump out quickly? I think a lot of these are, you know, more more starting points rather than a, a red flag or a smoking gun. But, you know, I think one thing that was interesting to me was some organizations, there'd be like a major disconnect in money in versus money out in either direction. Um, and sometimes that's not Sometimes it's just bad reporting or there's there's a legal reason for that. But I think sometimes, you know, we saw, I think it was Ron DeSantis's PAC, uh, his state level PAC gave, a, like transferred like $82 million in the state of Florida to his, I think his federal PAC. Um, and that led to like a massive disconnect in money and money out. So I think there's like, there's things like that that you can look for that are good starting points. Um, and then I think Brandon touched on this, but um, I think because because the data isn't super well regulated and people kind of can enter whatever they want for the purpose of an expenditure or the employer of a contributor, that can be a downside because it can be messy, but it, it can also be this really helpful hint that maybe organizations are connected or doing something interesting because they, I think basically up until now, it's hard to search by like expenditure purpose or contributor employer. So organizations like um, like the scam packs I was talked about would use like the same weird term because they were just kind of like going through it. So I think looking for like those kind of patterns is really useful. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll think about if there's other ones that stuck out. Yeah, we also aggregate um, the top donors and the top uh, expenditures which is how we found a dental pack that spent um, one point some odd million dollars uh, buying concert tickets. Uh, so they never answered our question as to the purpose, the exempt purpose of those concert tickets. Um, 
another couple questions that we had. Uh, one of them, uh, a consistent one, was whether this recording will be available later, and it will be. I believe it will be emailed to everybody who are a Um Another one, uh, Ruth, is how often the data will be updated and how often, uh, uh, secondarily, how often organizations have to file. Awesome. So we plan to update the data monthly. Um, and I think we have another data update that should be coming out soon after this. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and in terms of uh, how often organizations file, it's it's a little complicated, but basically an organization in an election year can choose to file quarterly or monthly. Um, I think, and in a non-election year, so an odd year, it can think they can choose to file, I want to say monthly or semi-annually. Um, look, you know, check me on those. Um, and the only caveat is like, once you choose one of those, you have to stick to it um, throughout the year. And then another thing to note about that is that um, they require, the IRS requires pre and post election reports in election years. So there'll be a report, I think within like two weeks uh, pre and post of an election, um, just to kind of give the public more uh, real time data as we get closer to an election. Thank you. Um, and there was another question that I thought was pretty good. All right, just scrolling through uh, the very good list of questions. Oh, uh, it was on aggregate below threshold. Is there a threshold for which, for which uh, they must be reported? And why is that so common in the database? Yes. So for contributions, anyone who gives uh, within a year more than $200 has to be reported by name. And for expenditures, any recipient that receives more than, I believe, $500 um, in, a, in a year, um, calendar year, I believe, has to be reported. Um, some organizations, can you can withhold the name uh, of a contributor or a recipient. Um, but you then technically, I believe, owe taxes on that money. Um, whereas if you disclose it, you do not. Uh, and you will see in the database, one, one fun thing to search for is, is the term withheld. Um, you will see some contributions that are listed, uh, the contributor name is listed as withheld. Sometimes, again, messy data, the line between those gets blurry in that some organizations like say withheld dash aggregate below threshold. Uh, and whether whether they're just not saying it because it's a legit aggregate below threshold or whether they're withholding a name and trying to pass it off, that's a question for further reporting. But um, those are those are the thresholds that you have to report names after. A last one for both Ilya and Alice. There were questions about how we um, like any caveats, like how you in your reporting, how you reported this. Uh, reported the totals and the numbers. I know Ilya, you sort of dealt with like a different issue because you were working with the raw data and Alice, you were working with the prep data after we processed it. So you guys had like slightly different experiences, but several people wanted to know like how you cited and copy added the data to the extent that you did. I can jump into that first. I mean, one, one of the findings I don't know that I mentioned was that, you know, we, we kind of tallied up all of the, um, you know, money raised and spent by the groups in the, in, you know, in the network that we that we kind of identified and found that you know more than you know thirty million dollars that was that was raised ended up just and ninety percent of, of that ended up being spent on just additional fundraising um, and you know one of the tricky things is that you know we were looking at the ways in which these groups were reporting expenditures and you, you know you, you know we were trying to bucket the 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 spending into you know whether any of it was on. Um, you know, actual causes that, that, you know, they were, that they were, you know, fundraising on versus, you know, um, you know, additional sort of fundraising expenses or office expenses, et cetera. You know, I think that's one caveat that we noted in the graphics is, you know, we kind of came up with our own methodology for bucketing spending, but, you know, the groups, when they report it, it can kind of vary in terms of how, of how much detail they actually provide. You know, there isn't, you know, necessarily, um, you know, clear, explicit ways of, of, of bucketing that. And so, you know, that was something that we kind of used our editorial judgment for. Um, um, so that's one thing I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, as you say, Ken, I, I kind of had to just handle everything with like great, great caution. Uh, I will say 
I think everybody who's spoken has like highlighted like a lot of different kind of like interesting tidbits and roads to go down. Uh, one that I don't think has come up too much is uh, refunds, but people do sometimes, contributors do sometimes ask for refunds. And uh, it's worth paying attention to those because there's usually typically probably a story between behind most refunds. So uh, it's kind of well worth looking at those as well because they are recorded. Want to see for you, Ellis? Did uh, the donor, and I assume this means uh, Mr. Eggers, uh, interviewed by you, uh, change his behavior after talking to Republica? Has Lawrence uh, changed the way he donates to organizations since talking to you and finding out that some of those organizations may not be using his money as he? You know, it's a good question. I mean, I, I can't really speak to his behavior. I can, you know, I did ask him several times just how he felt about the idea that, you know, the money that he was giving to these groups may not actually be um, being spent on the causes that he really cared a lot about. And he expressed just a lot of disappointment in that, both for himself, but also for the people who these groups, you know, are are really at least on the surface saying that they're supporting. You know, he felt like it was both a disservice to him, but also a disservice to uh, to those individuals, um, perhaps even more. And so, you know, I think that you know, I could I could envision you know that being something that he thinks about more. Um, but you know, he seemed to be somebody who was you know very dedicated to giving um, in general. And so, I think that you know seems to be something that he still you know held in high regard because he was a. He is a like consummate volunteer and donor, and so it's sort of hard for him, I think, to to figure out, you know, to sort of face that. Um, there's one last question for uh, Brandon and Ruth, a technical one. Uh, a few people have asked, what were sort of the technical libraries and tools that you used that sort of uh, helped you out and made this easier? Specifically, I think you want to know about how you did the fuzzy searching and things like that. Um, I can take this. Um, yeah, we used a lot of open source Python stuff to process this. Um, use a library called NumPy to do a lot of the the grouping and matching. There's a really cool um, address parsing library called um, libpostal, and it um, did really a good job for this. It made it a lot easier for us to to group similar um, similar named and similar addressed organizations where it wasn't exact. We also kind of cobbled together various things, various little algorithms and stuff that we found online. So yeah, like a lot of just open source stuff and trial and error kind of is what got us there. Yeah, we tried a lot of very technical solutions and sort of in the end, we have partial technical, partial human solutions, uh, a lot of this. I think that may be... Uh most of what we can get to now um anything else anybody wants to say there's there's one question i just wanted to address because it was it was a, a tricky point in my reporting process somebody asked about like uh some of the companies that are listed on the expenditures that are registered in states like wyoming um where you can't really you know see many details about the individuals behind the companies are kind of like a black hole i did want to address that because that was like a big issue and how much we could you know go into to detail about some of the, the the ways in which the money was being spent um something that was helpful for me in some cases was just like you know using services like pacer to search um especially like federal court cases um and because sometimes you know various lawyers out there maybe some of whom are on this call have also been like looking into these 527 groups and their spending. Um, and perhaps you may be able to see more details about some of those companies that have surfaced through lawsuits. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that because that was, you know, definitely a tricky process for us. You know, some of the, some of the expenditures, you know, were easier to track down than others, but yeah, there's definitely some states that make it a lot more difficult to, to see who's behind um, specific companies. Thanks. There's actually one last question I want to answer, which is about ActBlue, which is a really big um, 527 in the database. And uh, your I assume not to see view, there is no way that we can tell to figure out the ultimate, really ultimate destination for ActBlue donations. So in the FEC, if you donate to a candidate or organization through Act, uh, ActBlue Federal, um, you can see in the FEC what it's, who it's earmarked for. With the 527 data, you can't. And we've reached out to the ActBlue and IRS about it and have not really heard anything. Um, so that is an issue in the database. 
Uh, and on that, I believe we have hit time. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for this really detailed walkthrough. Uh, I learned some things. I hope you all did too. Uh, and a special thank you to Ilya for lending us some insight uh, into this reporting process and for uh, coming back to talk about it. So uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and supporting our work, and we will see you next time.